Shadow of the Erd Tree is finally here, and with it brings some highly challenging boss encounters that you'll want to be sure you're adequately prepared for. In this video, we'll be taking you on a step-by-step -step walkthrough on how to defeat the Divine Beast Dancing Lion, found at the end of the Bellarat Tower Settlement Legacy Dungeon in the Gravesite Plain. From Software has an established reputation of throwing some formidable first boss encounters at us, and Shadow of the Erd Tree is no exception. This boss has a moveset that is very tricky to read at first, and on top of that, several abilities that allow it to travel across the room, spew stuff everywhere, and fill up the screen, making it difficult to find a safe place to stand. Fortunately, it also has a lot of vulnerability windows from which we can deal out some punishment of our own and take it down. And with that, let's dive in on how to defeat it. This fight is broken down into three core phases. In the first phase, we'll be introduced to the vast majority of the boss's moveset, which consists of way too many biting attacks in addition to gymnastics and kicking up dirt. All of these attacks can be rolled through, but the most challenging of them is its long combo where it spins back, spirals through the air twice, kicks up from its maw, and finally spews debris in a circle before taking a short break. We'll be covering all of these abilities over the next few minutes and have you feeling prepared to overcome the challenge. We'll start with the long combo. This is the ability that will probably trip up a lot of new players considering that it's all over the place. But to break it down, I found these cues to be most successful when timing dodges. On the first spiral after it winds back, you'll see its mouth open on the right side and you can roll away as it slams down. On the second spiral, you can roll through to get behind the boss. From there, you can either stay out of range or roll through the second wave of debris and get some hits in. When it starts spinning around, if you're in front of the boss and in melee range, you can roll to the right twice with a slight space between the two rolls to avoid it. Now that we've got that move out of the way, let's look at its other abilities. If you're far away at any point, the boss can leap across the room and try to bite you as it lands. Once it's close to you, it'll cycle through a ton of different close range abilities, weaving in combos randomly. Its basic combo is a three-piece biting attack that has a couple of variations. The first two bites are rolled quickly. If you're out of range after the first two bites, sometimes the boss will only commit to those. Other times, the boss can follow up with a slightly delayed third bite or slam its mouth into the ground like it does in the long combo. This combo can be charged, and this ability, along with several others, allow the boss to start off with a bite in either direction. Occasionally, you'll see this rear swiping attack, but this usually only happens when you're behind the boss. The other charged up bite is a two-piece combo, which is identified by the sideways swiping chomp seen here. You'll also see another longer move where he rears back, but instead of biting, this one is a slam. And finally, there's a somersault-like ability where the boss kicks up and does a backflip. I know, I know, that's a lot of different attacks, but I did warn you. And guess what? There's more. Fortunately, these are much more unique in appearance and are more easily identifiable as a result. Perhaps the most identifiable move is the grab attack. The boss will rear back and click its jaws together several times before lunging forward. This is a pretty forgiving attack to roll, but missing it can be a death sentence without the proper damage mitigation. And if you do manage to survive, this ability also puts a buff on the boss that will copy the healing effects of your flask onto itself the next time you use it. So needless to say, don't get hit by this attack. There are two different kinds of breaths, the first of which is one that shoots debris in a direct line towards you, which you can continuously run to either side to evade. The other one is a circular breath, which happens in the long combo, but also has its own longer standalone version. This iteration also has the boss moving at a brisk pace in your direction during the spin as well, so be careful if you're trying to run away and counterattack. That covers most of its moveset, but this continues to evolve as the fight goes on. After reaching around 70% health, the boss can transition into phase two. The first time the boss phases will always be lightning, but throughout the entire phase will actively cycle between lightning, frost, and storm roughly every 15 to 30 seconds by jumping into the air, twisting around, and exploding with an aura indicating the active element. Each cycle primarily uses the same core moveset with some slight enhancements that take advantage of the active element. For lightning, most attacks will leave lingering lightning on the ground that will strike briefly afterwards, while frost and storm creates ice spikes and gusts of wind respectively. In addition to modifying the core moves, the boss also gains one additional move specific to that element. Lightning cycles include a thrown bolt that must be quickly double rolled to avoid both the projectile as well as the lightning strike that follows. During a frost cycle, a charged up version of Hoarfrost Stomp is used that can be jumped, and during a storm, the boss can conjure up a large tornado that it shoots directly towards you. I suggest getting as far away as you can during the windup for this, and then running directly left or right as it starts heading your way. The boss can be damaged between most of its attacks throughout all phases of the fight, 
but I recommend using a defensive playstyle during lightning cycles as it's quite tricky to hit the boss between its attacks without accidentally putting yourself into a lightning strike. Frost cycles will be more balanced between offense and defense as the ice spikes can be jumped and in most cases making jumping attacks quite effective. Storm cycles with the exception of avoiding the tornado are the most similar to phase 1 and more offensive tactics are encouraged. When the boss reaches low health, it'll stop using transitions to change elements and instead perform combos that weave all three elements together sequentially. This phase is much faster paced without the transitions, but if you remember to be defensive with lightning, balanced with frost, and offensive with wind, you can manage your playstyle between moves and take it down. Here's a few helpful tips to prepare. The Divine Beast is weak to fire damage and can be afflicted with poison, rot, bleed, and frostbite. The new hefty cracked pot recipes have massive buildup properties, so even if your weapon of choice doesn't support grease or have buildup by default, you can still apply them by crafting hefty pots for the effects you want to apply. These recipes and their materials are found all over the Land of Shadow, so be sure to look out for them as you explore the world. As for a weapon of choice, katanas are a great option as most of them can be coated with grease and include blood loss buildup by default. And personally, I found the Great Katana to be excellent for breaking posture as well. You can find this weapon early on in the Northern Gravesite Plain, right in front of a Ghost Flame Dragon if you want to try it out for yourself. Armor, talismans, and crystal tiers that boost defense to physical damage, lightning, and frostbite are recommended. And if you're using fire, you can't go wrong with the Fire Scorpion Charm, the Flame Shrouding Crack Tier, and Flame Grant Me Strength. If summons are your thing, Freya is great in this fight, and if you have decent throughput, she'll likely still have a fair bit of health after the boss goes down. She's also great at pulling aggro, giving you plenty of opportunity to strike the boss's side, staying safely away from its many biting attacks. If you have Mimic tier, they can also use the hefty pots you craft, making it that much easier to build up status effects. And that about sums up the Divine Beast Dancing Lion encounter. But before we go, here's a demonstration of the strategies we just covered. Thanks so much for watching! For more help on your journey through the Shadow of the Erd Tree expansion, head on over to our rapidly expanding wiki on IGN.com. And for everything else Elden Ring, stick with IGN.